and then they'll dig around the web somewhere and they'll figure out that well these are kind of their Ford Focus uh, let's say they all have Ford Focus and it's really simple and they'll try to figure out by getting the numbers like the um, the efficiency of the vehicle and then how much carbon per liter of, of, um, of gas it's going to emit for that specific car and they're going to get a multiplier and then they're going to, go, going to multiply that okay I'm done with my cars and that was a whole day of searching for data um, but then he's got everything else about the company there's a lot of stuff if, he's, if they've got offices in 10 different cities buying electricity and buying natural gas for heat it's all going to be different multipliers uh, what we call factors what our impact does is that it automates everything we have tens of thousands of those factors and what it, the way it works is that you'll be able to hear what you have is a um, a company that uh, that spells aluminum in Kazakhstan. Um, so there's there's kind of a setup phase where we ask questions about what the company does and what kind of things need to be taken into account. But once that once that's done, uh, you'll have a question here, for example, which is the annual consumption. When you actually uh, when you uh, when you make aluminum, you have anodes, cathodes. These things actually burn now because that's how that's how it works, and they need to replace them. Um, well, the system is able to know which units it you can answer the question in, so that it will be able to actually get the emissions in the end. So I'm, I'll be able to do kilograms here, just making sure that I'm on the demo site and not changing live data. I am. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> it auto saves too. So, um, and you answer a bunch of questions like this. Uh, if we go back, I, I won't go back, but. If we go back to the car question, how many kilometers you've driven, well, there's going to be a section in there that says, well, for the New York office, um, what was the company old car activity? It won't necessarily just be kilometers. The, company, the companies don't necessarily have that data. They might know exactly how many kilometers were driven in what type of cars. Or they might actually not even know that, and all they know is how many liters were consumed. Or not even, all they know is that they in, in, the, in April of last year, they paid $20,000 in gas. Well, what you need to do is $20,000 of gas in April last year in New York. How much gas did that get you? They got you this much. And for this type of car with the liters, how much CH4 would be emitted? That's the kind of chain of calculations uh, that, that it's going to do. And it, it figures all those things out based on the time frame, based on the locality, based on the activity. And it figures out what units it can take to get to those gases. Then it adds everything up. What you get in the end, something like this. Uh, so I won't get into the carbon accounting. There's those scope things. It's really boring. But basically, in the end, that's the kind of stuff you get. These are the tons of CO2 that were emitted um, per type of activity. So premises is things like the heat, like heating uh, for the uh, for the different uh, things for the different uh, buildings, business travel. Uh, that will include even things like a hotel stay in Helsinki in March last year. Um, well, on average, and you don't know precisely because you don't know how much water he actually used in his shower. <laughs> Maybe this guy spends an hour and a half in the morning. You have an idea, but there are no average. There's average data, and that's that's a big part of what our analysts actually do. They just they, they mine for data around the world. It's really hard to get these kinds of factors in China, for example. But then they mine for that and they import them to OI so that we can do that for those things. Um, but it's, it's a lot of data. The calculations engine is actually pretty neat. And actually, Michael Molly worked on, on that a lot. He did most of it. Um, but it, 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 gets, it gets fairly complicated. Um, another example is if your building is heated by electricity, um, how much, what are the equivalent emissions? In some cases, they all they'll know is the electricity bills month by month. So what we have to, what the system needs to know is that how much did three hundred dollars get you in electricity in, in Quebec City uh, in February last year? Well, we have the electricity prices per month per month per locality around the world. But then, where did the electricity come from? Did it come from coal, from nuclear? We have those things as well for pretty much the entire world. Uh, so depending on how the electricity was generated in that area, it's going to result in very, very different emissions. So for that company, you end up with, how's my time? Oh my god. Uh, here's an example uh, of 
the factors, uh, what I was talking about. So basically, what am I looking at? I'm looking at an office in London, uh, and we're looking at the travel of their employees by train. Uh, so what they've done is that they've been able to enter how many passenger miles have been used. Uh, so this is if they had 10 people traveling each uh, 1,000 kilometers, then that's 10,000 kilometers. So they have passenger miles, will convert to kilometers, and basically the calculations engine figures out all the chain of calculation uh, automatically for, for that place, for that time. Uh, and then it knows it's got a factor for national uh, trains that are inter intercity in the UK uh, in that time. And we know that it emits 0.05 kilograms of CO2 per passenger kilometer. And it has that for CH4 as well. It has that for 2 uh, So it, overall, you end up with, um, with a number for each type of gas. We also have uncertainty uh, associated with all those things. And the other thing that is kind of interesting is that uh, CO2 is the one we always hear about, but the other gases actually factor in. They'll have different global warming potentials. So there's, there's a multiplier that's um, where you take the final amount. That's the final amount of CH4 associated with that, that activity, but there's a 25 times multiplier, which means that a one kilogram of CH4 has 25 times more global warming potential than CO2. It gets to 288, but actually with things like refrigerant gases, it gets into thousands. So this is the product, this OI uh, is how the companies measure their total emissions for a given year. And that's how they get that final magic number so that they know how much offsets to buy. OI is all built on top of, it's all in Django, it runs on Ubuntu, uh, on uh, Amazon EC2, uh, Postgres databases. Um, so it's all using, it's using all those projects, and I might as well mention here that uh, we're on GitHub, and we'll release more stuff. There's a lot of internal technology that we do want to release, especially associated with our ecosystem, which I'll get to in a minute. It's uh, more interesting than the one. But there's, there's a bunch of things in here um, that you might find useful. Uh, Vinaigrette's kind of neat. It's a few lines written by Michael Molly. It lets you do uh, translations in any language of your data, but using PO files. The other projects basically add fields in your database. This one uses PO files so that you use the, uh, the normal get text facilities. So we've measured how much carbon we emitted. We went to the market and we bought, we bought uh, emissions offsets from some guy in Shade Street. <laughs> is he really growing those trees or is he pocketing money and pretending to? We don't know that. Well, yes, we do. What we do is that we have, um, so our ecosystem is the other big product that we have. ECT biocarbon tracker, that's one, it's kind of an instance of it. Uh, the, the way OE works is that we'll have different instances of the same product for different companies and they'll basically be paying us to, uh, to create a, uh, an incarnation of the product. So biocarbon tracker was done for Green Energy, which is the largest seller of biofuels in Europe. Why do they want to do that? The reason is that in Europe, there's regulations coming online. This is where, this is where the politics come in. If you want to sell biofuels in Europe, um, you need to prove that whoever you're buying, you're buying the sugar cane or whatever else, the corn uh, from, hasn't been deforesting large areas in Brazil, for example. Or you didn't take a huge marsh that had, was huge in biodiversity with 100 endangered species and they didn't just fill that up so that they could grow sugarcane so that they could buy, we could sell green energy, the sugarcane, who would make biofuels to sell in Europe. For little hippies, we thought they were doing good, but really they're <laughs> destroying forest. You don't want that. So there's regulations coming online. The problem is that there's no tools to prove that. There's no certification yet. So that's what we did. And um, what you see here is part of Brazil. Uh, you see some dots which are, my internet connection is a little flaky, but, oh, there we go. Uh, so that's one of the, uh, one of the farms um, that is selling uh, uh, sugar cane. Yeah. Like in Brazil, there, there's not really any conversion to bioethanol, uh, but they'll, uh, 
No, actually there is. There's lots awesome. of big, big mills. So that they'll actually convert the sugar cane to bioethanol and ship that back to, uh, to Europe. So these are the places that Green Energy buys from. But Green Energy doesn't own those places, and they want to make sure that there won't be a backlash two years from now when journalists find out that all the sugar cane they've been buying has been uh, helping deforestation in Brazil. What you're looking at now is the carbon change between 2005 and 2009. Um, it's, it's something that, as I said, we have, we have team of scientists. They've come up with algorithms to do that. This is the only map in the world of that type, and we have that for the entire globe at 100 meter resolution. Um, what you see in, towards the yellow end is uh, carbon, is, is places where the carbon content above ground has been decreasing. In blue, carbon content has been increasing. So overall, it's not that bad. In Brazil, there's that stuff happening, but overall, it's getting better and better. But this way, what is going to happen is that Ranger is going to look at the specific outlines of um, of the farms, and they'll be able to know whether the farmer has been deforesting around his uh, around his land or things like that. And if that happens, they just cut them off, and that's it. Here is another layer that is the this is basically the carbon content above ground. So we have special algorithms where we take images from the uh, from satellites, and we're able to deduce the carbon content. I have no time really to talk about it, but I'll be linked. These algorithms are actually open. Uh, there's, there's scientific articles about them, so I wouldn't mind talking about it. Just one minute. Thank you. Carbon risk index is kind of cool. What we do is that we combine the carbon data and with other data, and what we do is that we're able to tell you the red areas are places where we think that in the next couple of years there's a lot of carbon at risk of being lost and released into the atmosphere. So those are the places that should be watched. And here's a new one, deforestation. Um, this is actually brand spanking new, and we don't have that much data yet. Oh, here we go. You can barely see it. We've, we came up with deforestation algorithms. Uh, what we do is that we take data from a certain satellite every 16 days. We're able to tell you, we're able to monitor regions uh, very, very specifically, and we'll be able to send you a report saying this, that part was just deforested now. So the, 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 uh, all the people buying those things from the forest and want to make sure that there's no deforestation, or if governments create parks and want to make sure that it's not degrading, they can get alerts when that happens. And this is, again, something that goes around the globe. To give you an idea of scale, right now what you've been looking at is 30 arc second resolution, which at the equator is around 900 meters. That sounds pretty big, but it's for the entire Earth. The, if you look at the map of carbon that's here, um, wait, let's put it here. If you look at the map of, uh, of carbon, it's going to refresh eventually. Or not. <laughs> um, there are, in the database, we have, we have a row for every single pixel uh, that's about 900 meters square, and that's 222 million rows. <laughs> So when we started this, we were looking at small areas, and we were thinking, no problem. PostGIS has all sorts of things for these things, and it's awesome. You can tell it, give me the rows whose coordinates fall within the, this polygon. It's easy, George, I'll just die. It works for small areas. When you get to the entire well, the query times were around 15 minutes. <laughs> but the problem is that I want to be able to do this. Uh, let me just zoom. create a small polygon, any arbitrary polygon, it's telling me how many tons of carbon above ground there are. And you notice that took one or two seconds. Um, so that was one or two seconds to query three tables, each having around 20 million rows. Um, I have the amount of carbon per vegetation type, because that's another thing we do. We're able to determine what the type of vegetation is for every cell. Is it forest, and what type of forest is it? Is it grassland, okay. is it desert, is it water? So this table queries all of that, and it's able to tell you how many, how much carbon there is per vegetation type. And again, there's a there's a risk map here that tells you how much of that carbon is at risk right now. Being able to do that, that is that's part of our core IP. However, that's one part I'm not really able to do uh, to talk to you about. But 
being able to go from having lat long coordinates uh, and doing queries that were running for 15 minutes to a system where I can do these queries within one or two seconds, querying hundreds of millions of rows. Uh, that was that was pretty big, and that's what that's what's allowing us to do that. Um, the rest, in terms of actually showing you the tiles, that's all using open technologies. Uh, mostly even with some notifications, but that's pretty much it. There's a lot of caching, obviously, and a couple of terabytes of data, but I mean, it's nothing that hasn't been done before. So I'm out of time. <laughs> <laughs>